Okay, so Eduardo and I are the only thing that holds you between us talking and lunch. I'm going to give you this. Thank you. So we are going to stay on time. <laughs> Our next presenting company is Tygenix, and here to present is the CEO, Eduardo Bravo. Um, as you maybe heard earlier in the panel this morning, Tygenix is a regenerative medicine company that is developing CX601 for the treatment of co complex perianal fistules, which are caused uh, by Crohn's disease. The company is seeking approval in Europe and is also conducting, potentially conducting a phase three trial um, for US approval. But again, as we've been discussing, the new pathway initiatives may offer faster, um, or the new regulatory initiatives may offer a faster pathway. Um, company is also working in other areas as well, which we'll hopefully have time to discuss. Eduardo, thanks so much for joining us today. and. Again, I guess this is better before lunch than after lunch, but I'd like you to start off by really just describing what these fistulas are. It's a very severe complication of uh, Crohn's disease. You know, what causes them, and um, you know, how many patients actually suffer from these severe complex um, complications? So I'm not going to put up any pictures. Uh, this is a very common complication of, of uh, Crohn's disease. I mean, one in 10 Crohn patients suffer from these complex perianal fistulas. Crohn's is, is a systemic inflammation of the, uh, of, the, of the mucosa. And especially on the descending colon, when, when the mucosa disappears, there's ulcers that are formed. The, uh, those ulcers get infected, and the infection starts drilling a tunnel trying to find a way out. About 70% of the times that goes into the perianal area. That's the reason why the perianal fistulas are the most uh, common ones. But then some other patients will have those fistulas going into their bellies, uh, enterocutaneous fistulas, and especially in, uh, in uh, well, especially in, in women, some of those fistulas connect the rectum with the vagina into rectovaginal fistulas, which are extremely uh, debilitating and extremely difficult to treat. So about you know, 70,000 patients suffer from these complex perianal fistulas. If you put together uh, Europe and the US, in the US about 30,000 patients are available. Those patients have gone through everything and nothing really works. So it's an extremely uh, large commercial opportunity, uh, high unmet medical need and nothing that really works today. Great. So Again, the results were pretty impressive. We're going to get to those, but CX601 has shown activity in closing these severe chronic wounds. Maybe you can start by describing the product. What is CX601? And walk us through the phase two trial design. Phase three. Phase well, three. maybe we'll go through the... <laughs> the yeah. So, basically, these are allogeneic adipose-derived stem cells. So, we get fat from a healthy donor. Uh, we go to a liposuction clinic. We get fat from uh, women... Uh, younger than 40, and uh, we just pay for the liposuction if they give us the fat. As you can imagine, we get 100% volunteers, uh, and of course, those uh, those volunteers are screened very thoroughly, and then the fat is sent to our manufacturing facility. We select these two, three percent of uh, stem cells, and we expand them. Today, with one liposuction, we can treat 2,400 patients, which has a high impact on uh, on the potential cost of goods of the product going forward. So, that manufacturing has already it's uh, in our hands. So, you know, we do it ourselves in in Madrid. That manufacturing facility is approved for commercial manufacturing, and we're going to be manufacturing for Takeda as soon as the product gets approved. Uh, the uh, Phase three was uh, the largest ever phase three conducted in this, uh, in this indication, this complex perianal fistula and Crohn's disease. Very importantly, we concentrated on patients that had uh, their Crohn control, so it was either uh, mildly active or non-active Crohn's disease. Again, the idea was not that the cells will not work in the other patient population, it was that we wanted to ensure that there was no uh, changes in the underlying Crohn medication that will make difficult to understand whether the effect was due to 601 or, for example, an increased dose of anti-TNF. So uh, again, patients had uh, multiple fistulas. We would, we would accept patients up to three fistulas being treated with one single dose in one single procedure. All the fistulas were treated. Patients that had multiple fistulas in which, you know, up to three, two were closed and one remained open were considered a failure. And uh, again, we use the, the toughest endpoint possible uh, for the first time, not only clinical remission, that means that the fistula is visually closed, uh, but also through MRI imaging. Um, and again, there's no other compound that has gone through such a tough endpoint. And how exactly are the cells administered? 
So it's a, again, I will spare you the, uh, the details. Um, but basically, it's a very simple administration. You know, the, each uh, doctor, a, a surgeon will receive four vials. The patient will be under local, regional, or, or general anesthesia, depending on what the surgeon prefers and the patient. And it will be the normal cleaning of the fistula. This is a very thorough and very not very nice to see, but you know, they really clean the inside of the fistula to ensure that there's no dead cells, there's no scar tissue left, and that uh, there's, of course, no infection, and that the, uh, the wound is, uh, is bleeding because you want natural healing to happen. And then they stitch the internal opening uh, of the fistula, so the connection between the fistula and the, and the rectum. And usually today, that will be it. You know, the patient after that cleaning will be sent home. All you need to do when you get 601 is to put two of the four vials in a syringe, in a normal uh, plastic syringe, and inject it through the anal channel around the internal opening. And then the other two vials, again, through the fistula tract, injecting in a few blips along the fistula tract. So it's an extra 10 minutes to a normal surgical procedure that will take place anyhow. Excellent. I appreciate you explaining that because I think it's important to understand how um, these results uh, really are achieved. So tell us about the phase three trial results. I mean, really profound response right here. Absolutely. I think that, you know, even on the standard of care arm, because we were comparing our cells arm with, you know, patients going through this cleaning of the fistula, putting a seton in place, draining the fistulas, closing the internal opening, and keeping the underlying Crohn medication during the duration of the trial. And uh, that standard of care achieved rates of success that probably has, have never been achieved in the past, which shows that, again, those uh, receive uh, best possible uh, treatment. And all we added to that arm was one single dose of CX601 um, on day one, and then we followed the patients for a year. Uh, the primary endpoint was at six months, and at six months we hit the uh, primary endpoint with a p-value of 0 0.024, so we just hit the, uh, the uh, milestone. Uh, but I think that at that point a lot of the people ask, you know, what happens six months later? Because if you, if you have a, a better closing but the patients reopen, then what's the value of the, of the compound? And I think that what was really striking was to see that six months later, without any further treatment, 55% of the uh, 601 treated patients stayed closed. So uh, one single dose closed 55 of all fistulas being treated in, uh, in these patients. And more importantly, the rate of relapse after six months was halved from standard of care today to 601. Only 25% of the patients relapse uh, after 601. About half of the patients relapse, of, uh, relapse on standard of care. Yeah, that's really helpful. So very profound results. Now, you have filed in Europe. Um, what's the status of that, and when can we actually get approval? It was great to, uh, to get the Kiadi's presentation before because he's playing it already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in Europe, it's extremely transparent. You file, you get 120 days later what is called the list of uh, questions, uh, which is always very long, uh, that I can tell you. And uh, you have, uh, usually it takes about six months for a biotech to answer. We took five, but I mean, it's, it's basically the average. We submitted our answers. We got the, um, the what is called the list of outstanding issues uh, on day 180. That was in, uh, in uh, February. The average to respond to that is three months. So we are hopefully very soon going to announce what the calendar is that will eventually take us to uh, uh, final approval in Europe. Yep, excellent. Um, now you've also partnered with Takeda, um, so maybe you can tell us about that partnership and what are they doing in preparation for approval and launch? Yeah, I think that Takeda was our dream partner and I think that people maybe are not familiar. Takeda, you know, made the promise to be the leading GI company in the world. So GI is their, one of the three uh, focus areas. Entivio, which is their, their flagship product, you know, did 1.5 billion last year. It's predicted to be a 5 billion product uh, in, in, in the next few years, and it's focused on IBD. So 601 was a perfect match for, the, uh, for their Entivio franchise. And, uh, you know, what we licensed to Takeda was uh, the Europe, well, ex-US rights for the primary indication. And this is very important to understand. Despite this being the largest ever deal for a cell therapy product, we kept the US and we kept all rights on any future indication worldwide. And I think that you know, once we start developing 601 in, in other indications, which we're planning to do, people will realize how much upside we've kept for ourselves or how much we can still negotiate with Takeda moving forward. 
in terms of the uh, terms, you know, Takeda invested in the company, so they own today about 4%. They gave us 25 million upfront. But I think that the most important thing on top of, you know, royalties uh, and, uh, sorry, milestones, which are always, you know, biotech milestones, so you never know whether you will get them or not, we have a, a straight royalty line of 18% on all the worldwide sales. You know, 18%, probably they're going to sell much more than ourselves if we were to do it our, uh, alone. So that's probably the equivalent of a 25% net contribution without investing a single penny and taking any risk from a biotech company. So uh, I think that if I was presenting to my investors, you know, I'm going to make 25% make return on all my sales of CX601, they will be extremely happy. So this is how good this deal is for uh, Tygenix. Yeah. No costs associated with it. So what's up with the FDA here? Why are they requiring a piv uh, pivotal or in a second phase three trial? And we started to talk about this on the um, panel today, but you know, couldn't the 21st Century's Cure Act and designation as an RMAT change this for Tygenix? So I think that we need to, to understand where we are today looking at the history. Now it's, it's very difficult to, to, to look at what has happened and say, like, what, why, why are they where they are? So basically, we didn't have the money to do two phase threes in parallel. So uh, when we didn't have the money and we were running the phase three, and actually, you know, it was tough to convince investors to give us money, uh, even to run the first phase three, um, we went to the FDA, we did a type B meeting, we ensured that they uh, approve our preclinical package, we ensure that they agree that the European trial was what they would expect. So it was one of the two trials that they, they wanted. Uh, but at that time, we didn't have the data. They asked for a second phase three, which is the standard uh, procedure, as we do not have or we didn't have orphan designation in, uh, in the US. So then we had the time, we didn't have the money, so we went and wanted to get a, a, an SPA in place, which people thought that we were crazy to try to get for this indication, but we managed to get an SPA in place. The SPA was great. Then we got the European data. And then our US advisory board, which is you know the who is who in the GI space, actually told us, you know, with this data, you need to go back to the FDA. First, you need to change and, and even simplify the protocol. The most important thing is that we can file on six months data, like in Europe, given the the uh, strength of the one-year data, and the FDA has agreed to that. So today we have a new SPA in place that will save already one year from, from the timelines. That's, that was a great achievement. But then the question is like, why should US patients wait you know, on a product that is going to be approved four years to get a, a, an orphan product available? So now we have resubmitted the orphan designation. We will resubmit. We're waiting to get the uh, RM, R, RAT, RMAT designation, it's impossible to say. Um, and as soon as we get that, the idea is to have a pre-BLA filing uh, meeting with the FDA and try to convince them to give us conditional approval based on European data. And the present plan would still be to run the phase three if necessary as a confirmatory study, or does that kind of have to be determined as well? No, we believe that we will, I think that it's unlikely that we will get full approval. I think that we, are, we will ask for conditional approval, and actually we want to show to the FDA our commitment to running the second phase three. So we're starting the phase three uh, as we speak. You know, We will start recruiting patients in, uh, in, uh, in the middle of this year. We will open the uh, US sites uh, beginning of next year once we have the IND. So by the time the, we have the pre-BLA, the FDA sees that you know it's a, it's a very firm commitment, and it's just a question of time. All they are doing is allowing, hopefully, patients to have access to the drug two, three years earlier than otherwise. That's great. What are other indications for CX601? And I'm, we only have a minute and a half left, but what other programs are you working on? And maybe in the future, we can talk about those a little bit more. Yeah, I think that. You know, it's, it's right to focus on 601. I think that that's where most of the value of the company lies today. Um, the, the new indications, there's low-hanging fruit. There's other fistulas in Crohn and non Crohn. So, you know, we have in our corporate presentation that is on our webpage a very nice slide that shows that we will multiply by four. So, you know, there's 25,000 patients available for therapy today. We can multiply by that by three to four just by going to other fistulas in Crohn and non Crohn patients. On top of that, there are other GI indications that we're going to be exploring. And then there are non-GI indications. Given our partnership with Takeda and the GI focus of Takeda, we will go for the low-hanging fruit first. So GI first, but I think that the, we want to show to investors that this is not a product. This is a, a, almost a platform and that we can move into many disease areas with just a product that once approved, it will be just a single phase three clinical trial for some of those indications, very low risk, very quick uh, to expand uh, the access to the product. 
Well, great. With that, I'm going to ask you all to join us for lunch, I believe, upstairs. And uh, Eduardo, congratulations. It's been a really tough ride, but I know the last 18 months have been really a lot of progress that you've made. So congratulations on that. We look forward to hearing from the EMA and also hearing from the FDA about the path forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you.